Hi, I'm Dr. Nick Bird, CEO and Chief Medical Officer for the Divers Alert Network. My talk today is on dive accident management. As a way to begin this conversation, let's look at some baseline statistics about diving accidents and the numbers of divers in the North American region. We have about 3 million estimated divers in this country, and that probably equates to millions of dives every year. Out of all of that, we have approximately 700 to 1,200 diving accidents every year, and about 85 fatalities. When we look at the causes of fatalities, a few highlights really show up in the data. The first and largest group are those who drown. This probably isn't a great leap of understanding because they're in water, and so if they have health-related problems that lead to unconsciousness or an inability to stay, keep their head above water, they will ultimately drown. But most of us would also appreciate that the ultimate endpoint may have other causes as well. And so the other two big ones on the table are arterial gas embolism and underlying cardiac disease. You may look at this graph and also note that very small numbers of people die from decompression sickness and trauma, but these are really very, very minor. When we look at the issues that trigger these ultimate outcomes, a few other pieces of data also show up very, very profoundly. The first is 41% of these fatalities are associated with insufficient gas. Folks, that's running out of air. The next is entrapment. So running out of air and entrapment, you can imagine how these two might be related. Next is equipment trouble. Most of us would like to consider that probably the operator's problem with equipment rather than the equipment failing per se. A common theme with all of these, except for cardiac disease, is operator error, which means that our personal dive practices have almost everything to do with these negative outcomes of diving-related fatalities. When we look at cases of decompression sickness or decompression injury, there are some other great data that we've received from our project dive exploration. When we look at all divers across the spectrum, the rates of decompression illness are about two to four cases per 10,000 dives. When we drill down and we separate groups by types or, of diving or areas of diving, we get some other interesting results. The first group are amongst warm water liveaboards, and their rates of decompression sickness are even lower at zero to two cases per 10,000 dives. The other group, which is an interesting comparison, is in the North Atlantic above Scotland in Scapa Flow, and these are deep technical dives, so a very different type of diving as well, and their rates jump up to 10 to 12 cases per 10,000 dives. So let us then move on to underlying issues behind diving-related injuries, which are related to pressure changes. So let's talk a little bit about pressure. Pressure, as a unit of measurement, is a weight per unit area. And in at least North America, one of the most common measurements for pressure is pounds per square inch. When we think about that, I would like to give you an image. And it is a square inch column of air that extends from sea level to the edge of the atmosphere. That is about 10 miles of useful pressure. Now here we are, we're living, breathing, walking, talking in this air pressure all the time. And we don't really think about how heavy that air really is. Because if we take that square inch column of air and we were to put it on a scale, it would weigh 14.7 pounds. That is atmospheric pressure on Earth. So that's relative to Earth's atmospheric pressure. When we then relate what happens to us or what happens to gas as we increase pressure, we have the entry of Boyle's Law. And this slide is using the model of a puffer fish, which I happen to enjoy, as a model for an airspace. In this case, let's say a lung. So if we have a neutral lung volume there at sea level, which is the biggest puffer fish on the slide, and we take that down to two atmospheres, or double the individual atmospheric pressure, which we see at 33 feet, or if you're using the metric system, 10 meters, the volume will be cut in half. Same number of air molecules, but smaller volume. If we double that again to 99 feet, or four atmospheres, it goes down to a quarter of its size. 
One of the things I love about this slide is the predictability of Boyle's law. So as we increase the pressure to numbers of atmospheres, let's say 10 atmospheres, we can anticipate that the volume will be cut by to one-tenth of its original size. That's pretty amazing. 10 atmospheres, one-tenth. Those numbers relate. So it doesn't matter how deep you go, that relationship maintains. Now, that's important to us as scuba divers because we're not usually breath holding going from the surface down. We're actually breathing underwater. And this is a very important point. So if we start out with a neutral lung volume, which I'm noting here as a times one, indicating just times one, our normal chest volume. If we increase the pressure around us by two, i.e. we go down to two atmospheres, that volume would be cut in half, just as we said before. But when we're breathing, our lung volume, our, the size that, it, that our lungs take up, remains the same. But how? So how would we get that same volume, which would normally be cut in half, back up to its normal size? We breathe twice as many air molecules per breath. So at 33 feet, or two atmospheres, per breath, we're moving twice as many air molecules. At three atmospheres, or 66, we're moving three times as many air molecules. And at 99 feet, we're moving four times as many air molecules per breath. Just as the previous slide, this relationship would go down to 100 atmospheres. We would be breathing 100 times the number of air molecules per breath, whatever gas mixture we're breathing. This is important because when we talk about the potential of uh, absorption of this gas, you can appreciate that we're, our rate of absorption is going to increase with the number of air molecules that we're breathing. On the other side, if we were to be down, say, at 99 feet, and we have a normal lung volume at that point, but we know that we're breathing, we've got four times as many air molecules at our lungs relative to the surface. If we held our breath, our lung size would double if we went from 99 to 33 feet. And it would double again if I had a larger slide I could show you this to four times its original size. And as you might imagine, our lungs can't accommodate that level of stretch. And what happens? We have what's called pulmonary barotrauma. Pulmonary meaning lungs, baro meaning pressure, and trauma meaning tissue damage. So we have lung tissue damage relative to pressure changes. So our lungs stretch to the point where they would break or tear. And that will lead to potential escape of air where it shouldn't be. This is an important issue to talk about because as we talked about in one of the early slides, fatalities are related to air embolism and an embolism is a moving blockage made of air. There are other sources of emboli that could include blood clots or cancer or tumors, but in this case, these focal bubbles can go to areas of the brain or areas of the spinal cord and cause real neurologic damage. And it doesn't take much pressure difference to cause this. It's also important to remember that our other air spaces, like our middle ear space, that we have to equalize to adjust, can have trauma or damage to it in as little as a few feet. And the most common range of these issues happens in the first 10 to 15 feet of seawater. Our next law is Dalton's law. And Dalton talked about the fact that the entirety of our atmospheric pressure is the result of the parts of the different gases that make it up. So in the air that we breathe, about 21% of which is oxygen and 78% is nitrogen, that means that the total pressure, or that 14.7 pounds per square inch, 21% of it is from oxygen and 78% of that pressure is from nitrogen. For those of you who like learning aids, I think about this as Dalton's gang. So Dalton's gang, if you think of a posse or a group of guys on a horses, the gang is made up of multiple parts and those multiple parts make up the whole. Our next law is Henry's law. And Henry is a personal favorite of mine, not only because Henry's responsible for the creation of carbonated beverages that we all enjoy so much, but it is also why or, and how we use hyperbaric medicine to affect change. So these gas laws are not only important from us or to us from the standpoint of causing potential injury in the form of decompression illness or sickness, but also in the way that we use these gas laws for therapeutic benefit. Henry's law describes gas going into solution. And the greater the pressure of that gas above a liquid will increase the amount of gas that goes into that liquid in a very proportional and predictable way. 
it doesn't happen instantaneously, but it ultimately will happen. So if we go back to our previous slides where we were breathing, say, twice as many air molecules at two atmospheres, that's twice the amount of gas pressure, and that will ultimately put twice as many gas molecules into solution into our blood. So you can now appreciate, perhaps, that when you're down at 99 feet, or four atmospheres, and you're quadrupling the amount of gas pressure that you're taking in, you will also ultimately quadruple the amount of gas that will get absorbed into those tissues. So the last law is the law of gaseous diffusion. And this is what explains how gas gets to places from high pressure to those of low pressure. And if that's completely confusing, when we treat people in a hyperbaric setting, many patients often ask, so how does the oxygen know where to go? Why does it know where to go to the place that has the lowest supply? And this explains it. So when we have high amounts of oxygen in our blood system and tissue areas that have very low amounts, preferentially the oxygen will go to those areas where there are low amounts because that creates the greatest diffusion gradient. So if we look at this slide, the, air, the gas molecules travel from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration until a point of equilibrium is reached. What is wonderful about this law is that it actually works not just for gas concentrations per se, but specific gases. And this is how, when we're talking about breathing oxygen at the surface and helping to remove nitrogen that's in our tissues, those two gases can actually change places. And it's a way for removing one and adding the other. Let us now move on to bubble diseases. And bubble diseases is a kind of a soft term for decompression illness. And I include in that decompression sickness as well as pulmonary barotrauma, which can cause arterial gas embolism. We're going to start with barotraumas. There is a terminology piece which I want to be sure that you're clear on. Decompression illness is a term that is used in a lot of the literature, in a lot of diving magazines. But it is the composite of both decompression sickness as well as arterial gas embolism. For the purposes of this talk, I'm going to try to differentiate those two as clearly as possible. What is important, however, from your standpoint, is not always to differentiate, but to appreciate that from the first aid perspective and ultimately the hyperbaric treatment perspective, the management is very, very similar. Before I get into too much of the disease, I want to talk a little bit about the cultural bias within the diving community. Many divers look at decompression illness through a moral lens. That sort of feeling like you did something wrong. Where were you last night and what were you doing? And it has that sort of finger-shaking kind of perspective. To a degree, there's even almost a sense that this is like uh, a sexually transmitted illness. There's a real stigma attached to it, and people feel very ashamed. If I can leave you with at least one take-home message, it's that this is not an area where shame should have any role to play whatsoever. If you have symptoms and you were diving, it's reasonable to put those two together. And I would much rather have you seen by a medical practitioner who knows something about diving medicine or call us at the Divers Alert Network to give you some guidance than to not call at all. We're never going to give you a lecture or make you feel ashamed of what you did. We want to get you to the help that you need. So sources of arterial bubbles. When we talk about arteries and veins, these are the blood vessels of our body. Arteries are transporting oxygen-rich blood from the heart out to the body to supply oxygen, and veins are bringing it back. When we talk about arterial gas embolism, these are then bubbles within the arteries. But we can have bubble sources both from pulmonary barotrauma that we talked about earlier, or dissolved gas in our tissues that comes in from the veins. Commonly, we think of dissolved gas as causing decompression sickness, and arterial gas obviously causing arterial gas embolism. What is interesting, however, is that venous gas from dissolved gas within our tissues can also get over to the arterial side. This is what we refer to in medicine as a right to left shunt. We use that terminology, it's very simple, because venous gas returns to the right side of the heart and arterial blood goes out from the left side of the heart. If we have blood that bypasses the pulmonary circuit from the right side of the heart and goes to the left, we refer to that as a shunt. 
In this case, it's a right to left shunt, indicating the direction that, those, that blood or those bubbles were traveling. So at times, venous gas, which is on the right side of the circulatory system, can shunt over and become what we call arterialized, or work its way into the arterial system. The consequences of pulmonary barotrauma include arterial gas embolism, pneumothorax, and mediastinal emphysema. I'm going to talk about these terms, so if it's the first time you've ever heard them, fret not. The biggest concern that we have about pulmonary barotrauma and the release of air into the circulatory system is a condition called CAGE, or cerebral arterial gas embolism. This indicates gas bubbles that have gone into the brain or cerebrum. As you might suspect, onset of symptoms is usually very rapid. Cerebral arterial gas embolism, or CAGE, is a very, very severe problem. It can lead to death, unconsciousness, loss of coordination, cognitive disruption, so people have a difficult time thinking or communicating. They may have some personality changes. They may walk around in an unstable sort of gait, like they're really drunk or on a sedating medication, or they may just be a little confused. Oftentimes these symptoms are very rapid in onset and they occur very close to the surface or soon after surfacing, usually within the first five minutes and certainly all within the first 15 minutes. And about half of these cases have unconsciousness as part of the scenario. So that you're aware, a very well tried and trod characterization of this clinical scenario is people come up to the surface, they oftentimes will cry out, maybe go unconscious, and a few minutes later will regain consciousness. And they may or may not have recurrent or residual symptoms that last, i.e. that hit their nervous system. If you read the diving medicine textbook of Fred Beauvais, who is a cardiologist and renowned diving medical expert, in that textbook they relate AGE, or arterial gas embolism, with pulmonary barotrauma. Interestingly enough, however, when we look at chest x-rays or chest CAT scans, we only see radiographic evidence in about half of these cases. That doesn't mean that pulmonary barotrauma didn't occur, it just means that our testing ability maybe didn't pick it up, or we can't see it because it's not a big enough area of injury. So as we've talked about with CAGE, we may go directly to early death. We may have a static condition where somebody wakes up but they don't really improve, or they may have spontaneous improvement. This actually is something that I want to spend a little time on. Because we can all probably imagine that if someone had symptoms, that's the kind of person that we'd want to get to a hospital or emergency room. The person that we might be seduced into saying, you know, we probably can just wait it out or maybe not get to a hospital setting, is the person who spontaneously improves. And this is the person that we really worry about because they may regress or have a relapse of their symptoms. In an ideal world, they stay improved and no harm, no foul. Our concern is that they get treatment, they get some attention, and they go home and they have a relapse of symptoms. And that's who we absolutely want to avoid. So the take-home message here is that if anybody has had neurologic symptoms, characterized by any of the stuff I've just talked about, even if they've gotten what looks like a complete resolution of their symptoms, they should be seen by a medical professional. This, in the diving medicine world, is the equivalent of chest pain for emergency medicine physicians. Emergency medicine docs run the risk of liability when they discharge somebody who's had a history of chest pain. This is a big deal in the world of emergency medicine. Neurological symptoms that have spontaneously resolved and not received ultimate treatment are a consistent type of concern for us. And remember the cultural bias. People don't want to talk about the fact that they may have made some sort of error and they will be reticent to come to medical aid when they really could use it. So a few things about treatment, because many people look at all things diving related should get to a hyperbaric chamber. And I want to delineate a little bit of this for you. So when we start, pulmonary barotrauma all by itself does not necessarily result in cerebral arterial gas embolism. And that may sound a little bit confusing, because I've just spent some time talking about this. But there are other causes of pulmonary barotrauma that have no neurologic consequences almost all the time. And those might include trauma, people who have car accidents, gunshots, knife wounds, and have a collapsed lung, which we'll talk about in a second, or a pneumothorax, don't go on to have 
neurological symptoms and therefore don't require hyperbaric oxygen therapy. We've also talked about that people who have CAGE or cerebral arterial gas embolism may not have detectable pulmonary barotrauma when evaluated with a chest x-ray. And pulmonary barotrauma alone does not require recompression chamber treatment. However, a history of neurological symptoms in light of pulmonary barotrauma does require recompression. So it's the neurological symptoms that really should trigger a higher level of awareness and a faster transportation to a medical center. So let's talk a little bit about what we do with these people from a hospital perspective. So if somebody has a history of likely pulmonary barotrauma, we want to stabilize that before we get them into a hyperbaric chamber. Because the last thing we want to do is have pressure changes that make that system more compromised or put that person at greater risk of injury. We also want to do this before we treat them. So we try to rule out this pneumothorax, which I'll show you in a moment, before we recompress. So here is an example of a normal chest anatomy. So we have the heart and lungs. The heart and lungs make up the thoracic contents. A little earlier we talked about an entity called mediastinal emphysema, and this is the mediastinum. It is the heart and the, cent and the organs that form the space between those lungs. So the lungs in this respect are bookends. All the stuff in the middle form the mediastinum. So air in the mediastinum is what a mediastinal emphysema entity is. We talk about a pneumothorax, we're talking about a collapsed lung. So this is a lung that is getting crushed from the outside by increasing air pressure. Now a quick little bit of lung anatomy. The lungs are surrounded by a membrane called the pleura. The pleura is a two-layered membrane, one of which surrounds the lung and the other lines the inside of the chest. These two layers are actually sucked together by a negative pressure. It's a vacuum, if you will. If you violate that negative pressure, you will increase that space and it will go from being really a non-space, or what we call a potential space, to an enlarged space or real space. So if you, incre if you entered gas into that space, it will preferentially go into there because it's a, of a less pressure or lower pressure than the air pressure within the lung. So air will preferentially fill that space and it will enlarge that space and it will crush the normal lung tissue. And that is what a pneumothorax is. If you want to see this on an x-ray, this is an x-ray of that same event. So if you look on the same side of the chest, which is the patient's right side, you'll see the outline of that lung, that sort of white opaque area. Now if you look at the other side of the chest, you don't see where the lung ends and the chest wall begins. That's normal. On the other side, you can see a gap of space, a sort of a black air space between the lung and the chest wall, and that is abnormal. That indicates that, that lung is shrinking up. So how do we go about fixing that? We do this before someone gets treatment. We put in a chest tube, and that chest tube goes right into that space drains that air with a one-way valve, and we're able to re-expand that lung. Now, I happen to love this diagram because I look at the eyes of these two models, and the one with the pneumothorax has big wide eyes, and the one with the resolved pneumothorax has sort of mellow, cool, chill-looking eyes. So that is what we do, and then once we put somebody in a hyperbaric chamber in that environment, they're safe, and they're not going to get re-injured. A pneumomediastinum is air in that middle space, and this x-ray is a demonstration of that. It's very difficult to see for you unless you're really staring at it, but the outline of the heart is a little bit more prominent than normal. And that's because there is air there where there shouldn't be. A way that x-rays work is that the film is behind our body, and the x-rays actually go through the body when, they're, when the picture is taken. If that was the film energy, the x-ray radiation hits that film without any obstruction, it will expose that film, which turns it black. On the other hand, if it hits solid objects like bones, it won't hit that film, and that area will be underexposed or white. So if you have an area like that that is black and uh, more silhouetted than it should be, it demonstrates that there's air there, and I've made some arrows here to help us out with where that location is, and that indicates that someone's had a pneumomediastinum. It can take a little bit of practice to pick that up on an x-ray if you're not looking for it. 
The initial management for all diving related accidents is surface level oxygen or SLO2. The goal here is to provide the highest concentration of oxygen throughout the course of treatment for as long as your oxygen supplies last or until that person reaches definitive medical care. The treatment for mediastinal emphysema is just surface level oxygen. So the x-ray is done in the emergency room. We keep somebody on a surface level oxygen usually for a few hours and that commonly resolves this issue. For a pneumothorax, we put a chest tube in, help to re-expand that lung and that's the treatment for it. Now if you have pulmonary barotrauma with associated neurological symptoms, that's when we use a treatment table 6 or 6A. Here is an example of the U.S. Air Force's treatment table 6. Now some of you will go, hey wait a minute, I thought this was the U.S. Navy treatment table 6 or what happened to the Navy in there? This isn't a uh, branch warfare between the military branches. A treatment table 6 is the same dose. There are slight differences between the way the Air Force does it and the Navy does it and they all happen at the shallower aspect of this table. So this table has three oxygen periods built in at 60 feet of seawater or an equivalent pressure and then we decrease the pressure within that chamber up to 30 feet. The only difference between the U.S. Navy's treatment table 6 and the U.S. Air Force's is that the frequency of air breaks is more uh, with the U.S. Air Force than the U.S. Navy's. If you look up here on this table, the oxygen periods are 20 minutes long as opposed to an hour long for the U.S. Navy. I will tell you as an individual, operationally, divers tend to come in at midnight or one in the morning. Everybody's a little bit tired, so this keeps people up because they have to do something every 20 minutes as opposed to having nothing to do for periods like an hour. At the end of the day, the treatment effectiveness is the same. This is an example of a treatment table 6A, and the A stands for air embolism. And this is an example of a U.S. Navy table, which starts out with a spike down to 165 feet and then up to 60 feet. Let us move on now to decompression sickness. I like to start with a definition. So decompression sickness is the result of a decrease in ambient pressure coupled with an excess of dissolved inert gas. Now what's an inert gas? An inert gas is an example of which is nitrogen or helium. The reduction in pressure promotes a release of that gas out of solution and bubbles may form in tissues and or within the blood in sufficient volumes to interfere with normal physiologic function. A key point on this, and this may sound pretty silly, is that it requires decompression to have this happen. So people don't have decompression sickness while at depth. They have it as a result of their ascent or their time on the surface. To further reinforce some of the gas laws that we talked about earlier, we start with Boyle. So Boyle was talking about the fact that we're breathing more gas molecules per breath while at depth. Dalton was talking about the fact that we are breathing gas that's a real, uh, some mixture of oxygen and nitrogen. And when we talk about use of nitrox, we're just talking about playing with partial pressures. When we talk about Henry's law, we talk about the fact that we're breathing more gas molecules per breath. And so the more gas we're breathing and the deeper depth that we're achieving, the more gas will be absorbed in our tissues. This is all the more so for inert gases like nitrogen and helium that aren't being physiologically used for cellular metabolism. So who is at risk in this picture? We have a diver, we have a person in an airline, we have a U-2 spy plane pilot, and we have an astronaut. The truth is all of these people are at risk for decompression sickness if the setting is right. We all know about divers, but certainly U-2 pilots are at risk for decompression sickness. They fly at such high altitudes and certainly so are uh, astronauts and normal travelers who are flying soon after diving are also at risk. This is one of the key slides in this presentation and it lets you understand how we as diving medicine physicians diagnose decompression sickness. It may be sobering to realize that there is not a test or definitive study that I can run to diagnose decompression sickness. So the first part of it is history of a provocative dive. This is a dive that pushes the limits of your decompression tables. The next is the proximity of symptom onset to the dive. So did your symptoms come on 20 minutes later or did they come on 20 days later? And the last is what are your clinical signs and symptoms? 
if as if, for instance, you come down with clinical signs and symptoms of malaria, that's a little different than signs of decompression sickness. So you're trying to put all of the right pieces in the right box together. If you're lucky, you'll have elements of all three of these to really help reinforce the accuracy of your diagnosis. In the real world, I'm usually happy to get two, and the latter two are the most important. When you as a primary uh, or first responder talk to somebody and then call somebody like Dan or talk to your physician in the hospital, there are usually some pieces of information that we would like to hear. One is the dive history. And that really can be some very basic information, number of dives, deepest dive within the series, and obvious problems. Did the person miss their decompression stop? Did they have equalization problems? Were there rough water? Were they having gear troubles? Their history of symptoms. What is key here is when those symptoms came on. Not when they started bugging that person enough that they finally decided to come in to get health care. When did they start? And lastly, what does the examination show? Are there signs of neurological injury that we can detect on an exam? When we talk about decompression sickness, it's important to recognize that there is a timing issue. And about 90% of cases present within about the first six hours after surfacing. The last small percentage occur within the next 18 hours after that. When we get past 24 to 36 hours of new symptom onset, the diagnosis becomes a lot less clear and we really start questioning whether this is decompression sickness. This is probably my least favorite slide because it is a hodgepodge of potential symptoms and they're not in any particular order. But very common symptoms are joint pain, rashes, numbness and tingling. These are three that are worth committing to memory. Additional issues can certainly be paralysis, confusion, weakness, shock, extreme fatigue, even visual changes and trunk pain. All of these can be very telltale if they're told in the right context with the right sort of history. I'd like to take a moment to try to then to differentiate between AGE and decompression sickness. And you probably already have kind of a sense for this yourself. But when we talk about AGE, we're talking about onset, almost all of which were there, were, are within minutes of surfacing, and usually very serious neurologic symptoms. Decompression sickness, on the other hand, tends to have a more delayed presentation. It may occur soon after the dive is over, but usually they're somewhat delayed, and most of them are within the first six hours. The symptom range for decompression sickness can be a lot more variable, and it can mimic a lot of disease states. So a little perspective, too, on the way that symptoms present, the way that they show up. Symptoms that start early or soon after a dive and tend to be more severe will progress more steeply or usually get worse more rapidly. On the other hand, symptoms that have a very delayed onset tend to be much more mild and the diagnosis is much more difficult to determine. If you have questions about whether or not you think this is worth seeing somebody for, the Divers Alert Network is a very, very good resource for you. And if you don't have our number, here it is. It's 919-684-9111. We made it easy for you. You already know about 911. There it is, 9111. So let's talk a little bit about field management of decompression illness. We're going to talk about airway breathing circulation, oxygen, fluids, and issues surrounding evacuation. The use of oxygen is designed to do two primary things. Enhance the removal of inert gas, for most of this, this is nitrogen, and improve oxygenation to tissues that are compromised. Those are the two biggies. The breathing of 100% oxygen, or the highest concentration possible, also helps to remove nitrogen within bubbles, which causes, on its own, bubble shrinkage. It also tends to, to relate to a faster response to recompression chamber. So hopefully people require fewer treatments and respond faster to the treatment that they do receive. Many people ask, so how much oxygen should I have on board? How long should I give it? Uh, when's enough enough? And the short answer is you got to carry enough of it to provide enough oxygen at the highest concentration possible to sustain that person from where they are to the shore and hopefully to definitive therapy. So if, as if for instance, you're a boat captain or you want to run a charter 
and you've got about a two hour boat trip between the island and the mainland, you want to at least have two hours. Consider having a redundant source in case there's more than one patient. And also consider having an additional half hour to hour to pad the time that it takes to get from the shore to a hospital. Ways of increasing the supply of that oxygen include the use of a demand valve. If you don't have that, then you're using a non-rebreather mask starting at about 10 liters per minute flow and maybe ratcheting up to 15 if someone needs it. Or you can be relegated to continuous flow. Just remember that continuous flow masks will burn through your oxygen supply a lot faster. In very severe cases of decompression sickness, people can go into shock which is a medical term for inadequate blood supply to vital organs, especially the heart and brain. As a result, fluid resuscitation, by which I mean especially IV fluids, may be of critical importance and can even be more important in the immediate setting than recompression chamber. So if you're on board and there are people who are medically trained and someone is having severe symptoms, IV therapy, along with surface level oxygen, can be a great way of giving them maximal therapy until they get to a chamber. Fluids can also come in oral form. So you can use IV fluids and also orally rehydrate, which is just drinking fluids. Usually this is in small sips uh, throughout a period of time. You don't want someone to really just overdo it, but using oral rehydration fluids like Gatorade are a great way of giving them not only fluids, but some electrolyte replacement as well. So let's talk a little bit about evacuation and when to get somebody else involved. If you see this picture, I include this to demonstrate the use of a portable hyperbaric chamber. This is created by a company called Hyperlite, and it is actually a portable hyperbaric chamber that someone can receive a treatment table six in. For most of us, that would be a pretty uncomfortable position because it's a very cramped space. However, it may be a, something of great use in very remote locations. So when you think about evacuations, one of the first things you want to do is involve a knowledgeable person. This is a role that Dan can help to serve for you. We can help to give you guidance as well as local referrals. Try to maintain a higher inspired fraction of oxygen and fluids and transport to the nearest medical facility. If you do nothing else than get that person to the nearest medical facility, that will be a tremendous positive in their life. At the very least, you can get them in the medical system. Dan can be contacted at any time to help guide therapy or to help consult with the treating physicians at that facility. What we really don't want you to do is to bypass the local emergency room to get to where you think they need help, which might be a hyperbaric facility that's 100 or 200 miles away, and you don't even know if they're open. It's best that they get immediate evaluation and treatment and stabilization and let us help to get them to the right place. An interesting question that many people sometimes ask is, is recompression therapy always the first priority? Most of us think about it as, well, absolutely. You got a decompression illness, you got to go to hyperbaric treatment. But sometimes in very remote places, the guidance can be a little difficult because it's not quite the same thing as having the chamber down the street. It may be 36 hours of delay before you can even get a plane or some other transportation to a chamber, and then it may be an additional 36 hours or days before you can get from that piece of transportation to a hyperbaric facility. So with long delays or high-risk travel, hyperbaric treatment in more mild cases may not be as necessary, and we can really focus in on treating it with oxygen and IV fluids. On the other hand, if people are critically ill, they are best served by going to an intensive care unit, getting stabilized there, and then potentially going on for hyperbaric therapy. In an ideal world, you have both intensive care and hyperbarics in one facility, but that doesn't always happen. Again, while you're evacuating, maintain oxygen, try to maintain a horizontal position, and low flying altitude levels. Our goal is less than 1,000 feet elevation. If they have any signs of pneumothorax or pulmonary barotrauma, those are best stabilized before they get into the aircraft. This would be done by the medical crew that's there. And also manage urinary outflow. I put this in there because some cases of bad spinal decompression sickness can restrict uh, urinary outflow and people will not be able to urinate or pee. As a result, they may require catheterization so that you can keep on pumping fluids into them on one end and draining them on the other. 
Recompression therapy. I throw this slide in there to give you a little historical perspective. This is actually the research facility at Brooks Air Force Base. And the chamber in the foreground on the left is actually the chamber used to support the Panama Canal project. So the mechanisms of therapy for hyperbaric treatment include compression of bubbles. So this is pure Boyle's law. The other is to increase the pressure gradient of oxygen that goes absorbed through the lungs, is taken into the blood vessels, and can go out to tissues. So this is a big pressure gradient, and this is Dalton. So we're increasing oxygen concentrations. And last, we will increase, by that gradient, we will push oxygen out to tissues that need it, and that's Henry. So again, I'd like to reinforce the importance and also the synergy of these gas laws. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy has an additional great contribution, which is a modification or reduction in the systemic inflammation that occurs when people have bubble issues. Bubbles can cause a lot of tissue irritation, and if we can knock that down, we can minimize some of the symptoms and downstream tissue compromise that can occur. What's wonderful is that hyperbaric oxygen therapy can affect that change. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy occurs in two types of chambers. The first is a monoplace chamber. By its name, it's one person per treatment. These chambers are commonly pressurized with 100% oxygen, so that surrounds the patient in that facility. Both chamber types are equally effective for the treatment of decompression illness. The other, and perhaps more familiar amongst divers, is the multi-place chamber. By multi, it's more than one patient is treated at a time, and also a staff attendant is always in the chamber with you throughout the entire treatment. When we talk about diving-related accidents, it's important to consider the creation of an emergency action plan. What happens when things go wrong? It's good to start with immediate needs, so make sure that person's life is stabilized, airway, breathing, and circulation. If it's a diving-related accident, provide oxygen. I should also include here near-drowning accidents should also receive oxygen and intense basic life support, as well as immediate transportation to a hospital. Consider creating intravenous or IV access and arrange for transportation. You may wonder, how can Dan or the Divers Alert Network help you? We can discuss appropriate pre-hospital care. We can consult with emergency room doctors about diving-related issues and help to create a referral network chain between that treating physician and a, a receiving hyperbaric facility. We can help to coordinate evacuation and transportation, and we can also provide further referrals to facilities, locations, and community physicians. It's also important to know what we don't do. And there are a few things, actually, that Dan doesn't do. We don't fly our own aircraft. We don't affect rescues. We also can't diagnose over the phone. We can have a pretty good sense, but we're not here to take over medical management of the medical case. When you call us, it's great if we can get the diver's name with the correct spelling and date of birth. If they're a DAN member, it also really helps to get their DAN number. We really appreciate getting a, at least one callback number, if not two, to ensure that we can continue our dialogue, the nature of the accident, and some pertinent medical history. So when you're thinking about this sort of in sum total, where can DAN help you? Well, we can help with consultation, we can help with referral support, and we can help with accident insurance to help offset the costs that are oftentimes quite large in these kinds of environments. Remember, one last time, our emergency action number is 919-684-9111. Thank you, and safe diving.